I used ChatGPT to write that introduction, so yeah. Uh, sorry. Okay, cool. So the idea of today's presentation is to walk you through a project and understand the complexity of an ML project. It's not ChatGPT, it's not LLM, like traditional ML projects. Because most of the companies, when they collect the data, there is a lot of issues with data, and we will talk about that, those issues in a bit. But when they deploy a machine learning algorithm, they think it's done. In most cases, it's not. It's just the beginning of complexity of maintaining that project, maintaining that algorithm, and com like continuously delivered on the pair of your results when you deployed it. Because machine learning algorithms will deteriorate with time. Before we start, a bit about me. As you heard, I've been in ML for the past six years. I was, and I'm recognized as one of 150 machine learning experts by Google, and helping their teams develop strategies internally, what they're going to do. We didn't predict ChatGPT, and that's a funny story. We actually worked on their strategy about a week before OpenAI announced it. Everything we predicted was wrong. Worked on many different projects from like, uh, deploying an algorithm to predict consumption of electricity for European Union, which is used in today. And I led machine learning team in Photomat that created that OCR algorithm now used by 300 million students across the world. And I'm teaching online through courses, online, live, recorded. Currently, I have 350,000 students in that business. These two points are fine. So when we speak about machine learning companies or projects, in most cases, those are just the small bits of pieces of your company. There is a rarely the case where you are, have a machine learning-based company where that is the core of your business, such as Photomat. That's a really rare case where you have a surrounding teams to support that AI team. In most cases, the companies will contact me or like develop internal teams, just to have one more feature. And they don't understand what's complexity behind keeping that up and running, or keeping on the retainer consultant or outsourced team that's going to develop and maintain that project. In most cases, it's going to start as any other IT project. There is a business need. We want to improve something. There is a churn in a company. We want to prevent it or our support team is not delivering on pair of our actually results that you want. So there are many, many different cases from the business side you want to solve. Ideally, those are good cases for machine learning, right? And that starts. Now we have the idea of collecting the data. It's rarely the case where they already have a good quality data used for that machine learning project. It's often the case where you're going to start collecting the data, you end up having some data or purchasing data from some vendor, and then you start to train a model. Whenever you read about machine learning today, everybody's speaking about LLMs, ChatGPT, Google Translate, okay? Google itself, that's a machine learning model. So, but machine learning, when it's communicated, it's often communicated through algorithms. Algorithms are not that important, really. Yes, they are an important part, but the most important part of any machine learning or AI project is data. Everything starts from data and ends with data. If you have bias in project, if you have a poor quality data, you, have, you can have the best algorithm in the world, and your results will reflect that. And in most cases, this second part is a run-through. We have some data. Yes, let's do machine learning. Let's, let's buy it or whatever. They jump on the third part where they train the algorithm, where it's the most exciting part. We have some predictions. We can deliver the value. They test it, ideally on the good crafted test set. And then, surprise, we need to deploy it. We need to actually give it to the hands of users. It's, as any IT project, 
there is so much more complexity to machine learning. You need to think about the GPUs. You need to think about the data deteriorating your algorithms. So in most cases, when it's not the core of the business, it will end up like this, automatically scrape the project and say, it's not for us. And that's considered a failed IT project, right? Or they will invest more money and then fail the project. OK? It's really often the case. But the real machine learning project actually looks more like this. You have some goal, business need. Then you start with collecting the data. And then machine learning starts, which is the cycle problem. You're going to collect some data, prove that problem exists, train the algorithm, and then find out it doesn't work. Run back to circles until you end up with some model that is good to have. Deploy it, test it, monitor, maintain, and so on. It's never-ending cycle. In most cases, people will say, OK, cool, I deployed the machine learning algorithm. Let's go. But that's actually the starting point. In most cases, you will end up improving that model all over again. OK? So let, let me walk you through a couple of steps from this image to understand what are the questions, what are the, uh, what are the mindset of thinking about each of these steps. So when we sp start about data collection, it's the import most important part at the very beginning because that will lead to the success or failure of your project. The first question is, can we access the data? Sometimes you can have the data inside your database, but your copyright or the rules of your business does not allow you to have the data used by AI. For, for example, banks, they can't use user data to train their algorithms because of the privacy in their contract when you sign them. And in most cases, they can't use ML or AI to make a prediction whether or not you're going to get the credit. Why? In most cases, machine learning is not explainable. So when a bank wants to do something, they need to explain every single step on how they ended up with the decision of declining or approving you. OK? Then we, of course, can we, can we acquire the data? Sometimes it's not really possible to acquire the data, you know? And then the age-old question is, do we have the enough data? That question is really difficult to answer, and in most cases, it's more data the better, but then can we acquire it based on the costs? Can we acquire it basically, like for example, if you have a SpaceX, one landing is just one sample of the rocket, so it costs a lot of money to acquire the data, so you're not going to do it. So there are simulations for that. But also, how fast are we there to acquire the data? And should we hire a third party to do so? A lot of companies will do that, and that happened, I won't mention the names, in the past. You potentially know from UK what happened and so on. But many, many companies will try to speed up this process through third-party vendors. And to some degree, that's fine. But you need to think about their rules. Are they clear? Are they, are they GDPR compliant? You know? And then it comes to the data gap, the data usability. You can have all the data, but imagine this. You want to create a recommendation system for your users. You have some login page and or registration before that. You have some fields that need to be required. But then you define some optional because of the user experience. You didn't need that data. So of course, it's, if it's optional, most of users will just opt out and not fill it in, right? But now you want to do a recommendation, and you need that crucial piece of information that is now missing for 60% of your users. So now that you need it, you need to think about how to communicate to those 60% of your users, because you don't have quality data at this moment, because all of those points are missing. Just by design of not torturing your users to fill every single piece of information. Of course, duplicates of data, 
and then imbalance issues. So when we speak about imbalance, one of the projects that I was involved in was security at one airport. They wanted to prevent fraudulent activities at the airport. They had millions and millions of samples. But on 10 million samples, you have about 100 to 150 fraudulent cases. So you see the difference? You can build an algorithm just to predict zeros, non-fraudulent. And by statistics, you have the algorithm that predicts 99.996%. And you communicate that to your business partner and say, the best algorithm ever. Well, sure, but you have all, everybody predicted as a non-fraudulent activity. So you need to think about those. And, of course, data leakage is a really big issue in many cases. Like, did you consider logging some information in the browser that you shouldn't? Do you have some state that is just uh, running in the background? So all of those things can prevent you of using the data. And when it comes to the problems, I just mentioned a couple of them, but expensive, poor label. Like when you're targeting third-party vendors, you don't really have the control over their labels. You can say, okay, let's label the first batch, see if it's okay, and then keep going with them if it's fine. But you don't have that under your control, in most cases. And there is a lot of bias. So if you go to Google Translate, there will be a lot of biases built inside of it when you Google, when you try to translate about certain positions, like there is a gender bias. Then there is a, like a selection bias, which happened in ChatGPT, for example. When they trained the ChatGPT, they hired, bless you, when they hired 2,000 people to, to label the data. And they tried to sample all over the world, but they have their cultural biases as well, which are now built inside of ChatGPT. Okay? So on that scale as well. When you are working for a brand, I don't want to promote any brands now, but some beverage brand, they pay you to deliver that project, to do that analysis, whatever that might be, like, a, for example, sentiment of their brand online. They're going to give you a lot of money to do that, and you are going to be biased by money, especially businesses. Okay? So, yes, you can be a really moral engineer, but then when a business asks something, they will overrule that. I mentioned data leakage and outdated examples. So now that, that logical question was, okay, but what would you consider to be a good quality data set? Of course, complete information, balanced. So if you have a certain problem, let's say you're trying to predict versus cats versus dog, you don't want to have 10,000 images of a cat and then 5,000 images of a dog because that algorithm will have a problem. It will really well detect cats, but dogs less likely. So you want to have equal amount of images. If that means just not using 5,000 images of a cat, let it be. But that's a really important decision to be made. And in most cases, that's going to reflect to your business, to your client. This is a really toy example, but that's what we do and think about every day. The fourth point here is unbiased. So this is ideal case, but the data set is never unbiased. There is always some degree of bias in your data set. And that's why the continuously into working on your model all over, like again, 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 until you try to improve it and reduce that bias as, as much as you can, ideally you will never do that. But that's the case. You need to think about that. And always, like, ethical questions. Can we, can we make it better? Can, are they actually trained on a good examples or not? Now that we have a data set, let's say we are good to, good to be doing the fun part of training the model. There are a lot of questions here, or decisions to be made. Starting from do we have the correct data source that is going to pull the information to our model? 
And that's not happening in a machine learning team. It's often happening outside of it. Data engineering, database administrators, and stuff like that. Okay? Then, really important, defining the baseline. In most cases, people will just train for the first time and use that as a baseline. You can do it, sure, but that's not a good practice. And you will run in the circles of n comparing to something that does not exist, because you're just starting. So you need to have a third party baseline. Is that a human level? So for example, you're translating something, so you're building a translation model. You want to know what is the human level of translating between English and German, English and Serbian, and stuff like that. Or you want to set some arbitrary number and compare the first simplest model to that, which is still not a good practice, but people are using it. The second good practice is using papers. A lot of research is out there. You know what other companies is doing because they are producing those papers to prove that they are good. So use those examples and their performance levels as your baseline and try to compare yourself to that. Okay? After that, of course, we need to define a performance metric. metric. In most cases, we'll say, oh, I want the most accurate model. It's an accuracy. Sure, you're going to use that. But that's not the only metric that you're going to use. We'll talk about that in a second. In most cases, businesses will communicate your need. So sometimes you will have a lot of dependencies and a lot of questions to be answered by the business. So yes, from a technical standpoint, you can use accuracy, but a lot more is built into that. And we need to think about features. So people will create features. Feature engineering is a really important part where you can introduce more bias or reduce it, depending on how good of engineer you are. And creating subsets from data set. So what I mean by this? Goal of any AI model is to work on unseen data. So something that users will use in the future. You don't really know you're trying to replicate that experience by training it. But you, you don't really know what's going to happen when you put the model inside of user's hand. For example, in Photomat, we all, of course, expected a mathematical formulas. But then we received images of kids, of dogs, of houses. And people used camera for all of those cases, which is not something that we designed the algorithm to work on. So you need to create a subset, which we called test set, that's going to be used to perform the validation of your model just before you put that into hands of users. Okay? What I mean by that is, in this case, I had two engineers working full time for three months designing the right data set to make sure that we capture as much evidence as possible that's going to happen in production. So I needed two people for that, because you're deploying on the whole world. 280 million at that moment. So you need to make sure that you're going to replicate as many things as possible. Of course, we didn't predict all of them, but they engineered the data sets full time. It's as important as designing good algorithm. Now we train that. We have the data set stored somewhere, and we want to evaluate the model. Is it actually good or bad on that data? So in most cases, people will design, like and say, OK, let's start from accuracy. But before that, we need to design, think about, are we going to test the model offline or online? Why is this? It completely changed the deployment strategy. The architecture of your servers, architecture of your models, and everything that DevOps will do later on will be changed based on this decision. So yes, you think about oh, evaluation, of course. You're going to do both of this, but 
if you need to have online validation of your model, then everything changes. Okay? Offline evaluation is something that is normal. You have your model trained, it's inside your computer. You say, cool, I'll just run it on that data set that my, my engineers designed, and we get some number. Then we, based on this number, decide whether or not we are going to put it in production or not. But the other aspect of that is online, which actually, in the real time, while the model is up and running, you need to test it based on something that really happens, like churn, or online time, like are the users actually staying more or less on the website? To give you on a real case example, Amazon is doing real-time online predictions or evaluations of their recommendation systems. They have two, one that you don't see, the other that everybody sees, like people similar to you bought this, or together with this item you have this. And the real evaluation happens when you predict something, are they going to buy that or not? It's really simple. The other recommendation systems that we don't see that's evaluated even faster than that, they're predicting the next page that you're going to see. They're predicting exactly 13 pages in the future that you're going to click. Products, homepage, registration, and so on. And based on that prediction, they're loading those pages in real time for you. And when you click it, when you click something, it's going to happen exactly what they predicted, or you're going off the rails and clicking something that nobody predicted, and they're predicting next 13 pages. Why is that? Users are really hard to uh, make happy these days. They want everything immediately. And because of this, they find out the study, there is a, there is a huge paper about that, that you need to deliver results online for under two seconds. So they are loading those 13 pages, so you get that page in less than half a second, if they predicted well, of course. And they're immediately evaluating that online just to make sure that you are staying on the right track as they predicted. They increased a lot of traction and online time on their website with this, but without online training, online evaluation of the model, you wouldn't be able to do that. And the whole deployment of this model took about half a year, just deployment, not creation, just because of this fact that they need to do that online. Model metrics is as important as this, the fact of evaluating that, because that's a number, that's something that you're going to follow. And whenever you start looking at those performances, you're going to see an accuracy being thrown all over the place. There are a couple of other metrics that are really, really important, but in general, accuracy is most widely used. But imagine this, when I go to my client and say, oh yeah, this model is accurate 95%, and my client is not a technical guy. That doesn't mean anything to him. So, it actually needs to communicate how well I targeted that specific issue that he had. In most cases, you will have other requirements for your model. So I can build the most complex model ever. But if the client requires, for example, to return the results in under 0.7 seconds, I can't do that. So for example, ChatGPT, everybody potentially heard about it. They, they return results in about 15 to 20 seconds, depending on the length of your result. Imagine that you, every time that you go to a certain website, let's say Google, they're predicting what's going to interest you. Imagine that you need to wait 20 seconds for the results of Google. Of course, that's going to be bad. So that's why they're communicating this small number of, I found the best result match in under 0.001 second. So they have a business requirement to return results in under 0.2 seconds. And that's why they communicate that every single time to all of us here when we Google something. And of course, 
This is done in most cases for big companies by third party, but you need to evaluate on ethical questions. I'm not an ethical researcher, but we had a lot of collaborations with those guys because when you're deploying on, on that large scale, you need to make sure that you're doing everything right. I'll give you one example what, where we, it, it was not ethical screw up, but we actually made a mistake. When we expanded to the Spanish speaking um, continents, or I would say Spain, Portugal, Brazil, we didn't know back then that in trigonometry, SIN is actually written by SEN there. So our algorithm returned correct results, but in the wrong language. So they got offended. And we had about 20 million users unhappy. Big screw up. We didn't know, but that happened. So you need to test and think about these small nuances that can lead to somebody being angry at you. And in machine learning, you're never going to end up with one model and say, the, the first model that you're going to test is going to be the best model. It never happened to me once. So you're always going to make five, ten different models. When we worked for one client for a recommendation system recently, every week we created five different models. Test it and decide which is going to be the baseline for the next week. So you are constantly re-evaluating your production model with the trained models, new trained models, and then potentially changing that in production once we are happy. And strategy for comparing, of course, you can do A-B tests, you have G-test, multi-arm bandit, which is really often used these days, and defining a metric only on a data set and using that as an offline baseline and then deploying that. Multi-arm bandit, I don't know if you heard about it, it's basically when you have different set of models, let's say five different in production, and you see which one is going to yield the best results, and you just communicate and redirect results to that one, and you destroy all of the rest. Model deployment. When you speak about the deployment, there are two different, two different cases where actually leads up to big decision in this moment. So static deployment is something that is rarely the case these days. But for example, if you have a, some machine, a, a mobile application that has an AI model built inside of it, that would be static deployment. You are deploying it with your mobile application. That has many positive sides, but also negative sides. We had the first versions of Automat was deployed with the application. And it, the negative side, well, on old mobile phones, it lasts about 15 seconds to return the prediction. Not a great user experience. And it was really expensive to maintain. You need to redeploy everything, push to the Google Store, App Store applications every single time that you change the model in production. And that happened on a weekly basis. So you needed every single engineer on the call. Dynamic deployment is often the case here where you're deploying something in the cloud and you're trying to build infrastructure around it. Much more expensive to maintain in a sense of like uh, server cost and stuff like that. But then easier to maintain or cheaper to maintain from the human perspective. And it's constant in the speed of, of returning the predictions. Deployment here is really similar to something that, in general IT, you use, except multi-arm bandit. But basically, you can deploy the single model. You can silent deploy or shadow deployment. In, um, in most cases, we are going to combine two of them. So shadow deployment first to find out if the new model is better than the certain current solution. The current solution can be in, is often the case where the current solution is actually based on the rule-based systems. So you have rules. You basically have that. You see if the AI learned model is actually better than, uh, um, than the current solution. If yes, amazing, let's do with it. If not, 
keep iterating. Once you're happy with the shadow deployment, you start releasing with the Canary deployment, where you're releasing by percentages. Now to 10% of users increase to 15 and so on. But then you need to think about, about a lot of things here. How hard or how difficult is the model to deploy? So we had, in many cases, the model of two pieces. So you need to deploy two different things. One for user calculation, the second one for items in the recommendation sense. So you need to think and think about those two models together. That's one thing for the self. Then, is it really easy or difficult to roll back to the previous one? What if one part is working, the second one is not working correctly? How to sync those together? Are they actually working together as the one old part and the new part? So, those questions need to be answered. Code-based structure. So, I made third, but I think it's the, one of the most important parts because in most cases in these teams, you're going to work with the researchers. They hate structure. They're going to put everything under one file with variables called A, B, F, and I, when I read the code, I don't know what I read, without comments, <coughs> because who needs comments? So in machine learning, it's really the big problem when you're working with researchers. The end-to-end -end models test is needed. Then information security. So do you have any leakage in your predictions? Are you, are you, for example, GDPR compliant on the data side, but when model comes to play, are you still GDPR compliant there? Do you have some features inside the model that will capture user information that shouldn't be captured? So you need to scrape that model. Okay. And of course, scalability and speed of the request. So not only the model, but everything together with the model, for example, needs to be under 0.7 seconds. So your model needs to return actually another 0.3. So that eliminates like 70% of any machine learning model ever existed. And when you deploy, you need to monitor. That's the biggest problem because people are not predicting this. In most cases, when you deploy something to production, you need to maintain that, of course. But in the AI sense, data will change. To give you an example, because I mentioned recommendation systems a couple of times, I had about five clients at one moment where um, COVID started. And all of five recommendation systems failed when COVID started. Those are good models. They worked flawlessly before. But when COVID started, the data changed. People didn't purchase under, after 8 p.m. They purchased in the middle of a the day. They started purchasing different items. They didn't purchase items that are like often the case. They purchased more masks and so on. So everything that we built, scrape, start again. So you need to iterate because, only because the data changed. So now, because of the new data, it doesn't mean that the algorithm that you have in production will work. Okay? So you need to think about those data drifts, which is called here. And data drifts can come from malicious users as well. And that's not the often case, but that can happen. It can happen like a bug in, bug in the pipeline. So because, let's say, sometimes you're going to work with data in a way that you're going to pre-process it, let's say change all strings or text data to some representation of it, so you can actually work with it in the, inside of the model. So all of that needs to be pre-processed, right? So you can actually make some predictions on, on top of it. But that often introduces the bug because you change the pipeline without the control, without the test. Okay? Model drift is something that happens often, but not as data drift, where you are actually doing the predictions really often where the model just becomes stale and you didn't retrain it that on, on a regular basis, so it, you had an old model inside the production. 
So, when we speak, uh, sp spoken before the, conf uh, before the starting point, uh, what can go wrong in production? Everything, they said. So, I do agree on top of that. But yes, so I mentioned that based on the data drift, it can go instant drift, for example, COVID that I mentioned. Then you can be gradual drift. So classical recommendation systems can go like wrong because of user preferences. We all grow. We will change our behavior. We are not going to buy 10 Steam games today, but we are going to buy something else. So just because the one user grew, like a year or two, or like in the future, their way of like using your system will change as well. Per periodic drift is something that happens in like hotel, hotel industry really often, where you need to recommend something differently in the winter, something differently in the summer, and it's really just that part of the year, and that will change. So you need to cap capture that information with your algorithm. Temporary drift is something that happened. IoT device, for example, happened. Like one, one project from, uh, uh, I had a client from US, they had four different buildings monitoring, and they, they had basically IoT devices monitoring the consumption of energy and temperature and everything in their, uh, in their buildings. And we were hired to make a prediction on the consumption level of each floor. And when they delivered the data to us, we found out that in building B, uh, floor I think five, every single day uh, between 1 and 4 p.m., one IoT device were turned off or didn't capture any data. We didn't know why. Well, what happened? Cleaning lady, plug out, turn on the vacuum cleaner, cleaner and then just return the IoT device in the, in the charger after that. So we need to explain and stuff like that. But you can't predict that behavior. We mentioned a lot of these things, but more, uh, some of these are more technical, like for example, GPUs, because of the random states inside of them, they can actually introduce a lot of errors to your machine learning algorithms. So you need to think about hardware as well when you're deploying it. And on top of that, for example, when you are deploying some algorithm, you need to think about how fast you can start a new instance. So if you have more traction to your application and your instance starts in four minutes because of the GPU warm-up period, well, that is really bad. You need to think about how to start that instance in less than 30 seconds, for example. So back to this image. Now you know why most of the machine learning projects fails. Because you need to think about all of this together. Well, not you, but the whole team. So it's not like training the machine learning on the data and put it in production. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. That was quite inspiring. We, of course, have some questions over here. So can we combine static and dynamic deployments? So, for example, when there is no internet yeah. to fall back to static model or use static model to mm -hmm. speed up requests on dynamic model? Yeah. Um, that's really a difficult, great question. That's difficult to manage. But there is called federated learning, where you basically, for example, have a, a mobile application where you deploy instances of the model to that phone. You deploy it. People use, and they have personal model inside of their phone. And av after some time, you basically bring that model back, every single model, uh, bring back to the server, where you train everything together and combine the learnings of each individual model. This today, like it's really the case when you have that, you don't really need it, but it's possible, and yeah, there is technique for that. All right, uh, what are common BS metrics? Common BS, like bias, uh, a bias metrics. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, so. 
for bias, like you don't have a real metric instead of like going to the data set and, and figuring out the data yourself. Like we had a team of about 100 people constantly monitoring the data set. So like maybe there, there are like her metrics, definitely. But on the scale of those big project, projects, you can't really figure it out, especially in images. Like in images, you can figure out the bias. In the like textual data, you could. In the tabular data, which is often the case, you can go and based on statistics figure it out like what are the commonalities, what are the disbalance of the data and stuff like that. So use statistics for that. But if you're working with unstructured data, there are limitations to those techniques. And uh, do we have any question from the audience? Oui. Excuse me. I, I can hear. <laughs> So at the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned yeah. that it's good if we have a lot of data. Yeah. So what are the strategies of actually pre-processing and processing these kinds of data sets? Because I suppose you cannot load it all at once. Yeah. And what kind of configuration regarding the computer side is actually necessary to train some average, average model? Let's call it that way. OK. Uh, I'll try to answer, but it's really like uh, based on the case thing. So on the size of the data sets, there is no one size fits all solution. You are going to start with some like amount of data. Like in images today, because of the all new developments in the model sphere like area, you have the opportunity to train on like five, ten K of samples. When you're speaking about recommendations, it requires much more because you need to capture the behavior of the users. Um, the text data these days require less and less because of the models that are out there. So it really depends. It, if it's like a really specific, like healthcare, for example, data requires a lot of a lot of data points to capture the, whatever you wanted to predict. For the computer size, and before that, like how to load the model. So you have something called batch training. You, like you map all the data that you have. Let's say you have, I don't know, terabytes of data. You, of course, you don't have the RAM memory to all load all of that. So you're going to load partially, like load first 10 gigs, then load more, load more. And then you basically remove that from the RAM after you're done with that part of the data set. Well, your model stays constantly loaded into the RAM. Uh, that's just one technique. Uh, but the uh, big like uh, companies such as, for example, uh, Google, OpenAI, Microsoft, and stuff like that, they train on like thousands of GPUs. So they basically load parts of each data set to the specific instance. Let's say you have 10 different clusters of how many GPUs. So you have parts of data set loaded in a certain pieces, and you have one, class, one server which combines everything to one model. That's how ChatGPT was trained. So that and for starting point, because like today you have a lot of resources out there to start for free. Like if you have basically MacBook Air, for example, you don't you can't natively train on top of it because of their like capabilities. But what you can do, you can use Google Colab, you can use um, Lambda, you can use um, SageMaker by um, Amazon. All of those are either free, like Google Colab is completely free, and it provides GPU, so you can train basically most, most of the models are there for free. Uh, if you want to have some, something like um, on-premise, on, for, you, for your sake, some average laptop with a dedicated GPU, NVIDIA, it should be NVIDIA, um, is completely okay. Like free 1,000 plus series, 16 gigs of RAM, you can start. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Luca. Um, fortunately, time for questions is up. So uh, give it up for Luca one more time. Thank you. <laughs>